Well, praise the Lord. Isn't the Lord good? Hallelujah. Amen. Well, we weren't making light of receiving tithes and offerings. We understand that our offerings are very precious to the Lord, and we offer them up. And we didn't mean to act like it was real quick. It's time to take up offerings. But most of you know that Billy Graham passed away this week. And uh, our crossed over would be the best way to put it. Because the day he accepted Christ, he was already in the kingdom. And so anyway, with, with all of that, we wanted some time this morning so that we could uh, not necessarily eulogize him. He will be eulogized plenty. But I can imagine around the world right now how many people, how many people have gotten born again and their lives changed from a simple gospel a very, very simple, simple gospel. He wasn't a complicated preacher at all. Uh, it was just so edifying. And I want to just start off with a little bit of, of my testimony. If this was going to be titled today, I would probably just call it the ripple effect. I know you've been hearing about it, the ripple effect. If you've been listening to anything about Billy Graham's life for the past 99 years, when he got born again and the things that happened in his life, and so many great things happened in his life that I guess if you wrote it all down, I don't know how many books it would take to put it in there. But I can take one little small paragraph or chapter out of his life and put it in my book. And the, his life has affected my life, and the life of his that affected mine has affected others that I've met. And so I just want to honor him. And I would like to just go all the way back into the month of June of 1977. And those of you who are familiar with this, yes, this will be the quick version. And so I just want you to know that I was 24 years old. That was 40-something years ago. Anyway, I was 24 years old, iron worker. I'd done pulled several years in the military. I was on the DMZ in Korea. I had come home and become an iron worker, and I was hanging still. And uh, met this beautiful woman. We got married, been married about three years, had a kid. We was all excited. And then that June of 77, when my little boy is about three, three years old, my marriage is just young and we're just getting going. But I was living in a pretty rough old world. I was pretty well addicted to drugs and alcohol. I was a good worker. I'd show up for work. I'd work, 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 work. Couldn't hardly pay bills, though. I needed that money for other things. I know you wouldn't understand, but, you know, it was hard for me to pay bills. It, you, it's hard to keep your drugs and pay bills, too. You have to make a choice. That's why when you look at my refrigerator, it was empty. You look at my food pantry, it was empty. But you look, in my drug drawer, it was full. And so I went and bought a pound of pot. I usually bought it by the pounds. And I got a pound, and I sat down, and I was cleaning the stems out and bagging it up. And it was on June it was in the first week of June of 1977. I bought a case of old Milwaukee and a pint of Lord Calvert. And what'd you get all that for? It was a Clint Eastwood week. He's supposed to be on every night. And I even quit working over. I worked over every day. I wouldn't work over because I wanted to go home and watch Clint Eastwood every night. I just wanted to get stoned and watch Clint. Ain't nothing like being high and watching cowboys shoot people. So that's what I wanted. And I came home and I had it all going, cleaned out, TV on. And at 7 o'clock, they preempted it, and they said, the Billy Graham crusade is going to be on this week. Oh, I like the melted. I thought, how bad can life get? I am so set up for a wonderful evening, and they ruined it. Well, while they did that, it started. Well, I'm rolling, and I'm buzzed up, and I'm drinking, and I'm sitting there. And my wife comes in. It's probably been on 10, 15 minutes. And she said, what are you doing I said, oh, I'm waiting for Clint Eastwood to come. I didn't tell her it was praying. I said, Clint Eastwood's going to be coming. I'm waiting on Clint Eastwood. And she came back a little bit later, and I'm just engulfed in that TV. And all I can tell you is that Billy Graham was just dealing with things about what's keeping you from God. What is keeping you from God? And I kept hearing it every day, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday night. I mean, I come home Friday night, and I'm ready for Billy Graham for the first time. Ever. I mean, I got to have it. It was awesome. I prayed with him every night. Nothing happened. Couldn't get saved. Didn't know why I couldn't get saved. Didn't know what's going on. 
And I just, something about Billy Graham, it just, it just burned a hole. And the next day, my daddy drove up from North Carolina, a Baptist preacher. I told him what happened and how I prayed all in prayers and how I wanted to get saved. And he explained to me about faith, and it clicked. And we prayed again, and he said, are you saved? I said, yes, sir, I sure am. And I knew that I knew that I knew because I believed it by faith. I kept waiting for an emotion and a feeling, a, a shake, thunder. But I'll take anything. Anything, But when you said it was faith, it's like you take anything and you understand faith is much more simpler. So by faith, I received Christ. And I've always credited Billy Graham because the Lord used him in a way that other people couldn't touch me. My father and grandfather Baptist preachers, and I love them and no disrespect to them. But when people scream at you about your sins, it makes you want to run from them. But when somebody looks at you and tells you how loved you are in the midst of your iniquity, <laughs> and they're not mad at you, and they're explaining, God's not mad at you. It's just the iniquity that you're in will send you to hell. And, and just hearing all of that, as a matter of fact, do y'all have a small clip that I watched that week? I think my wife was supposed to send it to you. If you do, can you pull it up? Can't see you, and I can't hear you. I'm just hoping you're going to hit a button and maybe it'll come and up. And Hezekiah was one of the best kings that Judah or Israel ever had. He labored mightily for his country, brought reforms and turned the people back to God. But then it came time for Hezekiah to die. And he prayed, oh God, don't let me die. Please, oh Lord, spare my life. So the Lord spared him for 15 years. And a few years later, in that 15-year period, was born Manasseh, who became the wickedest of all the kings. Some people live too long. I know people now that I think would have died much, it'd been much better had they died earlier. That's right. But Hezekiah also opened the doors and showed all the treasures that Judah had to the Babylonians. And they came in later under Nebuchadnezzar and stole all that. They said, we want the riches of Jerusalem and Judah, and they took it. But having lived a full life, the Lord had said to Hezekiah, set your house in order, for thou shalt die and not live. But Hezekiah would not accept the will of God. And so he turned to God and begged him to live. He refused to accept death, and he did not set his house in order. Yes, I think some people do live too long. Manasseh became king at the age of 12, and he set himself to undo all the good things that his father had accomplished. He was a very wicked man. The Bible says that he was guilty of some of the worst idolatry in the history of all of Israel or Judah. He set up gods everywhere, even in the temple of God, other gods where people worship. And idolatry is anything that comes between you and God. It's where self is preferred over God so that all of us here can say in one sense we've been guilty at one time or another of idolatry. And God hates idolatry more than any other sin. And under the law of Moses, a man could be stoned to death for being idolatry. For engaging in idolatry. Covetousness, the Bible says, is idolatry. If you covet, if you have greed, and it becomes a sin in your life, it can become idolatry. And when the Apostle Paul was walking around in Athens in his day, he looked at a city, the Bible says, given wholly to idolatry. And Paul warned the Corinthian Greeks, flee from idolatry in 1 Corinthians 10. And Paul defined a Christian to the Thessalonians as someone who had turned to God from idolatry to serve the living and the true God. Are you guilty of idolatry? Is covetousness a part of your life? Is greed a part of your life? The Bible says, keep yourself from idols in 1 John 5. Keep yourself from those idols. Is that little box that we call television, is that your idol? Do you spend time quietly worshiping in front of it? Do you spend more time with it than you do with the Lord in prayer or study of the Bible? What is your idol? 
We have today almost a worship of film stars, television stars, sports figures, all the rest of it. We can't help but have people in our day that have made instant celebrities on television. And we look to them and we think, oh, wouldn't it be great to be like one of them? I wish you could talk to some of them. How miserable many of them really are. How empty they are. I talked to a man today that's in a show tonight somewhere around Denver. He happened to be going up on the elevator where we're staying. And I talked to him and he said, Mr. Graham, I'd much rather be coming out to hear you tonight. He said, I need what you've got. I said, can you come tomorrow night? He said, I'm certainly going to try. I hope he does. What is the thing that means more to you? Is it your bank account? Is it sex? Is it drink? Is it drugs? Is it sensual pleasure? What is it? What is it that causes you to be an idolater? And then the second thing that Manasseh was guilty of was immorality. He built altars to Ashtar and Baal. Vile and obscene orgies they had. And priests would cut themselves and beat themselves and then commit immorality with the temple priestesses or prostitutes of the temple. The same today. We see it everywhere. The Bible speaks of an evil and adulterous generation, Matthew 12, 39. And Peter speaks of an unregenerate society having eyes full of adul ad ad adultery and that cannot cease from sin. You want to give it up, but you can't. There are relationships you need to break to save your marriage, but you can't. There are thoughts that you have in your mind you'd like to get rid of and be dominated by the thinking of Christ. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, but you can't do that. You have no power. If you come to Christ tonight and open your heart to him, he'll give you a supernatural power, the Holy Spirit, that can help you break away from those relationships, break away from those things that are wrong, break away from those things that come between you and God. Ezekiel wrote of those who were old in adultery. Age will not cure you. You may think it will, but it won't because our hearts become hard. And the Bible says, he that hardened his heart being often reproved shall suddenly be cut off and that without remedy. You can come to a meeting like this and harden your heart. You can hear the gospel and your heart gets a little bit harder. And sometime you may want to answer the call to Christ, but it may be too late. Is that possible? We'll see in a moment. And then Manasseh had religion. He had religion, even the devil believes. Nicodemus came to Jesus and he was a religious leader and he began to ask Jesus some spiritual questions, religious questions. And Jesus said, Nicodemus, you need to be born again. You're a religious leader, but that's not enough. You go to the temple several times a week. You tithe all that you have. You're a good man, but that's not enough. You need the new birth. You need the Holy Spirit to come from above and change your whole direction of living and change your heart and change your spirit and change your relationship to God. Judas was religious. He was the treasurer of Jesus' little band. The other disciples didn't guess that he was a traitor, but he betrayed our Lord and became one of the great people of history that we look down on as a great traitor. James 1.26 tells us of the men who say, who may seem to be religious, but deceiveth his own heart. This man's religion is vain, the scripture says. Jesus said, they serve me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. How many of you are like that? You go to church, you serve God with your lips, you sing the songs, you say the creeds, but your heart doesn't belong to Christ. He's not the Lord of your heart. Now that right there was about six minutes. And just what he said in just six minutes, I bet you there's not a person in here that, that did not provoke your thinking about something in your life. I guarantee you. That's just six minutes. I listened to him every night for a week. I couldn't tell you exactly what he was saying, but it was those statements that were, that were hitting me. Because with the grandfather, 
that started a whole lot of churches and was in the ministry for 70 years, I'm going to tell you something. That his prayer is still working. He prayed for his children and his grandchildren. And then prayers are still working today. My granddaddy's prayer is working on me. My daddy, I remember hearing my daddy pray outside down the street with a group of guys hanging out on the corner. He said, what's that? I said, that's my daddy up the street a block away. He was in the bedroom with the window open praying for me. And the whole, whole world could hear his prayer for me. I know God heard it because everybody heard it. <laughs> so I'm just telling you the power of prayer and the fact of those type words, how they affect your life. And so when I was watching that on that Friday night and it ended and I prayed, I felt like God had nothing to do with me. And I heard, I was under conviction. I had this great desire to want to be with God and know God. And when I die, I want to be with him forever. I don't want to go to hell. I'm tired of living like this. I'm tired of not being a good husband. I, don't, I want to be a good daddy. Everything about my life, I just need God in it. Because, man, I was a mess. I mean, I was a mess. I mean, when I got out, of, I was doing great in the military. Did great. About to re-enlist. I, I was the youngest sergeant in my unit in history. And, I mean, I was ready for promotion, ready to go in and get a big bonus because I had a combat MOS. And we were going to get married. And she said, I don't want to be in the military. I don't want to travel. I said, well, I want you so bad, I'll certainly let go of the Army. And so it was after I got out that it seemed like it went down. It was when I got out and got married and got a child and got a job, my life spiraled starting going down. And then I've heard of Billy Graham all my life. I've seen him on TV and stuff. Never, you know, I've never seen him live in my life. I've never seen him in person. I actually feel like I know the guy. And so watching him and the words that he's preached and ministered and come into my life, when my daddy showed up that night to show you God in this, and I told him what happened, that night was June the 11th on a Saturday night. We started talking at 12 midnight when he pulled up. 2.30 in the morning, Faith dawned on me, bowed my knee at a coffee table. I remember my hair was so long, the hair was laying on the table when I bowed my head. And I bowed my head with my daddy and said a prayer. And I just knew that I knew that I knew that when I said that prayer, that if I believed it was so, it was so. And that settled it. And about two or three minutes later, after the prayer, my father was seated and I was seated. And I was sitting there thinking, wow. I have struggled with this so long, and it's so simple. That's what I was thinking. It's so simple. And all of a sudden, the house started shaking. Boom, 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 boom. And I looked, and he was jumping up and down with his fist balled up. Glory to God. Ah, glory. Like that. And I've never even seen a Baptist act like that. And I said, Daddy, what's the matter? He said, oh, you don't understand, son. He said, it was June the 11th at 2.30 in the morning at the bleachery when I bowed my knees and gave my heart to Jesus Christ. And I prayed for you and your brother. And I've been praying for y'all ever since. And God just told me to look at my watch. And I did. And he reminded me, do you remember June the 11th? Hello? 2.30 in the morning? I just wanted you to know I reserved this to show you I heard your prayer. And that's what he screamed out. He heard my prayer. And so he went bonkers. Well, Billy Graham was a big instrument in God hearing my father's prayers. Now, I'm not sure who won Billy Graham to the Lord. And I, I really don't know a whole lot about all of that. But you talk about a ripple effect. I can only talk about it from Billy up. Can you even imagine the saints in heaven from Billy back that were connected by salvation through the message that are looking out of that great amphitheater Looking down in the earth. I'm getting ready to tell you something. You better hear me. I ain't being nice. They're looking down in the earth and they are totally rejoicing because every seed they sown and every person they sowed until it got to even just that one man and all of you could be the next Billy Graham. And when it got to him, he took it and run with it. He didn't go home and sit down and just read the Bible. He went out the door. He went in the community. He went to the people, the places, the nations. And that's what the church is to do. We've got to quit taking it home. You're supposed to take it out of your church and out of your home and give it to the world. That's where it's at. It's out there with them. They're hurting. They're crying. Even though we're born again and we love the Lord, look what we still deal with. Look at what the pressures the earth puts on us. But at the same time, 
look how we're able to deal with it compared to the way we used to. When I came to Christ, I, I was in such a bad shape leaning in the world's way. I was nine months behind on my daddy's house. He didn't know it. That's a house payment, by the way. Three months behind on a car payment. They were looking for the car and park it behind the house so they couldn't repo it. I mean, I was in such a mess that the only thing I had was a pound of pot and a lot of alcohol. That was all I had. And I'm telling you, the gospel of Jesus Christ, the gospel of the kingdom of God will set you so far free from drugs and alcohol, addictions. I'm talking about problems and immoralities, the things that worry you and pull you down, the family members that you love so much that just make you worry, 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 when you just learn how to release it to your help because your help is him. He's your helper. He said, I'll send you a helper, the Holy Spirit. And when my help comes, then my strength is there. And I I feel weak, but he said, well, let the weak say I'm strong. Why? Because once I say I'm strong, I have what I say. And he said, let the poor say I'm rich. Why? Because you have what you say. And so I quit saying what I had and started saying what God says I can have. And if you'll say what God said you can have, you'll have it. Because you can do what he said you can do. You can have what he said you can have. You go where he tells you to go. Now, Joy Blair says it's mental if Jesus is talking to you, but it's okay for you to talk to Jesus. But she lit a fire she never knew about. When she did that, people that she knew that she didn't know that knew Christ said, are you calling me mental? He speaks to me, and it's freaking her out. Because there's so much grace and love and wisdom when we come to God and we just bow our hearts and we bow our knees and his love and his compassion pours upon us no matter how much sin's in our life no matter what we've done no matter who you are even Hezekiah and his son both could have been more redeemed and blessed than anybody just by doing the word just obeying God can I get an amen but I want to tell you that man's life <clears throat> touched me so much that when I was about three years old in the Lord I just started pastoring and when I started pastoring we wanted really good leadership and our finances for our church. So I went to Mr. Harvey Watson, one of the most well-known men of churches, working with churches and their finances and how to stand before the IRS and be accountable. So I went to Harvey Watson and his wife, Helen, and they took our ministry and began to work with it and get it in order to make sure everything's great. And that was good. Well, I got to know them good, so they kept inviting us back to their house. And then I went to their house one evening and we're sitting there and Helen says, my brother's coming. She said, you're going to love him. His name's Grady. And so he comes and Grady comes and we all have a good meal and we cut up and laugh and stuff. And uh, Grady looks at me and he says, uh, tell me, when did you come to Christ? And I told him my story about Billy Graham. And every night I told him the whole story. He was writing it down. Tell me some more. And he kept writing. What's he writing? And he kept writing. And so when I got through, he just laughed. He said, boy, is Billy going to love this? And I said, Billy who? He said, Billy Graham. I said, you know him? He said, do I know him? He said, you don't know who I am? I'm Grady Wilson. I'm his right-hand man. I'm the guy that does all those introductions on TV. And yeah, 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 yeah. I said, you are? He said, yeah. And when we got to talking, he said, I'm telling you, you're going to hear from him. I said, oh, great. I said, I want to see him. All my life, I've wanted to see him. I've made calls. I've talked to people that work for him. I've done everything to try to see him. But that's all right. There's a reservation for me and him. And so, are y'all okay out there? But this whole thing about how all this came about, the ripple effect, and, and Harvey and Helen, well, the next thing I know, my birthday comes, and he sent me a birthday card. And so I seen Grady. I said, he sent me a birthday card. He said, you have no idea how that story of your life touched him. He said, and he loves to know about the people that got born again in his meetings that are in ministry. Nothing moves him more than knowing that you took it seriously and run with it. He said, I'm telling you, you're going to hear from him. I've got a birthday card from him every year, even this past Christmas. I've got a birthday. Now, the last one I got, it looked like it was factory printed big time. There was no hand signature or anything. But I'm here to tell you something. That means a lot to me for a man to hear about me. He doesn't even know me. But he knew I was living in sin and broken. And he knew I heard the gospel and repented. 
And because I repented, it changed my life to the point that I just gave it away. And I was preaching on construction sites. And I was witnessing everywhere I went. And when somebody next to Billy found out about it, they said, Billy got to know. He's got to know. He, because the percentage of the people that go to the altar and literally keep walking with God. Yeah, I don't even know if y'all want to hear it. But it's like out of 100 people that go down, 93 walk away. So around six, seven out of 100 take it seriously and go with it. So when you see a 1,000 people at an altar, you got maybe a couple of 300 people down there. They're not joking. Everybody else is just wondering and curious and not sure or whatever. So we got to understand that all this stuff is so good. But that's how I got to get Christmas cards from him was Harvey Watson had married Grady Wilson's sister. Who would, you never know what's going on. The world's smaller than you think it is. Somebody, you know, somebody. But the small ripple effect, I don't have enough time to just talk about what I can remember this happened in, in the ministry. But there's nothing happened in this ministry, including this church, that would not be if it had not been of that preaching, of that gospel, of that anointing, of that calling. And yes, we're honoring God, but we honor the man. The Bible says give honor to whom honors do. And I would say one reason it's more do him than anybody, you'd have to honor him in his death because in his life, he won't let you do it. He wants it all to go to him. And that man, everything he ever done, he pointed to him, everything. He never criticized. He was full of love and compassion, different than other preachers. Jim Baker told this story and I heard it out of his mouth. He said, I committed a 15-minute sin. He said, now that's the truth no matter what the media told y'all. 15 minutes. He said, I didn't even enjoy it. I hated it. And he said, I had a fear it was going to destroy my life. And he said, lo and behold, it did. And now I got 45 years in prison. And I'm laying on a mattress this thick. And I'm balled up in a fetal position, weeping and crying, asking God, why did you even let me be born? And while he was going through the misery and the crying, he heard somebody walking down the hall, which was different because where he was, he only hears things at a certain time of the day. Heard keys jingling. Heard his door open. Said he was laying there thinking, why are they coming to my cell? He said, and then I heard this voice. He said, Jim, it's me, Billy. He said, man, I rolled over on that bed and I looked up and Billy Graham was standing there looking down at me, smiling. He said, me and the Lord come to visit you. And he sat down and prayed with him while the rest of the world's criticizing him, while old women that send him social security ties is hope, I hope he rots in hell. I heard it. And while all that's going on, there's Billy Graham. Who's Billy Graham? A man that's not worried about his reputation. A man that doesn't care what you got to say or think. He's more concerned what God's going to say or think than anybody. And they told him, if you go see Jim Baker, it won't look good. He said, it might not look good in this earth, but oh, it's going to look good in heaven. And so that's the kind of man, I can't explain the kind of man Billy Graham was. He's phenomenal. He's just wonderful. He touched my life. I've heard things about him that, that you know, because I got born again under him, I let it go. I thought it was great. That's okay. I'm, I mean, things like there's only two perfect people. I heard John Hancock say this, two perfect people. There was only one perfect person in the world. He said, and that's Jesus Christ. He said, but everybody I've talked to is pretty well convinced. Second runner up, hello, was Billy Graham. I thought a little humorous. I thought, well, he might have a point there. But Billy will be the first one to tell you what. We've all sinned. We've all come to the short of glory of God. He'd be the first one to let you know when you start edifying him. Hey, listen, I'm just like you. I put my pants on like you. I make mistakes like you. I don't want to edify and go there. Let's go with him. Let's go with him. Let's go over here. Billy Graham had such an anointing to just bring you into the presence of God and leave you with Christ. And that's all he ever wanted was you and him to have a relationship. I've never heard him beg for money. I've never heard him make money an issue. You know what he always made an issue? Souls. Always, always wanting to win souls. Shield of Faith would have never been born if we hadn't got born again under that ministry. The school that went for 30 years, the children that come out of it that are doing tremendous today. It wouldn't have been so. I could go on and on. The woman in the metal brace that had no spine, that got completely healed and took the brace off, that brought a whole village of people to the hotel we were staying in 
to, to heal the sick. And when I was leaving and looked back and I saw all those people being prayed for by people in our church. And they're hitting the dirt. And I mean, that's just crazy. Crazy stuff. It's because we got born again under Billy. Of course, you could take that ripple and go before Billy. And we can take this all the way to Calvary. And I mean, from the moment the first drop of blood hit that dirt off of Calvary, all the way up to, to this moment has been a ripple effect. I can only identify the ripple with certain things like you. You have ripples that have affected your life. And if you go to a pond and throw a rock in the middle, you see the ripples. And there's not one, there's many. And one comes back. And have you ever noticed that how the first ripple seems to be small and the more they come, they'll get bigger and then they'll filter back out and get small again. So it hits an exponential and comes back down. I'm just saying that the anointing, I'm telling you, there's something up here going on with me right now, and I'm trying to minister this to you, but I'm about to just weep and cry because of souls. Uh, This man had a heart for souls so bad, and that rippling effect is what it's like. You know why he sends me a birthday card? Because I'm touching souls. He don't want me to quit. He wants to encourage me. And then he's, he's up in age, and he can't go out and visit thousands of preachers that got born again. I, I'm just one. Can y'all even imagine? How many of you got born again under his uh, preaching yeah, by curiosity? Billy Graham, have anything to do with anybody being saved in here? Your mom? Anybody else? And you? Now, see, I would be thinking a bunch of you would, not you? I'm telling. And, and you'd probably be surprised that the people that touched you were touched by Billy Graham. And thank God that, that he was called America's pastor because if America's ever needed one, it does right now. And if we've got an example of what one's to be like, we've got one. The thing I loved about him was in the 60s. In the 60s, race in that day was worse than it is today. Black people in the 60s were still having to go to the back of the lines. I mean, they were. St- I remember. You might say, oh, I wasn't. So, yes, it was. I saw it. And I remember how anybody 60 or 65 years old and up, you remember this in the South, and they were like that. Billy Graham come in and got with Martin Luther King, and they agreed, we got to do something about race in our country. We're brothers. Now, they, they had big disagreements on some things, but the thing I admired about both of them, they both had a desire for souls and unity of race in our nation to win this world to Jesus Christ and get your eyes off on who's better than who and who's got lack and who's got this. Let's embrace, let's join, let's share, and let's do this together and let's watch God do something awesome. Because if we don't, we're going to divide. And a house divided, it just can't stand. So I say let's not divide. I say let's come together and let's believe God and let's watch him move in this earth. And I believe we'll see him move in a great and mighty way like we've never seen before. Why? Because according to the scripture, when a man of God or a woman of God dies, they never take the anointing with them. No. Catherine Kuhlman, when she died, every person connected to her ministry got a double portion of her anointing. Can you imagine that? Now see, when Elijah and Elisha, Elisha was following Elijah and He wanted to. He saw him, and he said, I just got to go with that guy. He said, I want to be with him. And so he goes with him everywhere he goes, does everything, carries his briefcase, helping him out. (laughs) And then he tells him, I want want that anointing that's on your life. And he says, if you see me, by the way, and that means if you agree with me. He said, if you see me when I go, if you're in agreement with me when I leave, you'll get a double portion of my spirit. Not God's spirit. You get a double portion of God's spirit, you're going to blow up. You get a double portion of my spirit. And then, Elias gone. Elisha reached over and picked up his mantle and lifted it up. And the Bible says he did twice as many miracles as Elijah. And he did it with Elijah's mantle. But Elijah's mantle came from another before Elijah. It's the same way today. Still doesn't stop. And here's what I am saying prophetically on February the 25th of the year 2018. And that is that now is the threshold door breaking of a great revival in the earth. Not because he died, but because the mantle is going to get picked up. Are you listening to me? It's the day for the Elishas that have been groomed by Elijah. 
to know that those like Billy Graham would be my father in the Lord brought spiritual birth. He's gone. I have a spiritual right to that man's mantle. You have a right to that man's mantle if you've been connected to it. And every person you know that you're connected to that has a mantle, when they leave, you should grab it. I'm telling you that mantle will bring something on you. Listen, my father could interpret dreams like, I mean, it was crazy. And when, when he passed, as soon as I saw his corpse, I grabbed him. I grabbed his face, and I got right in his face in a casket. And I said, Father, I thank you that I will have a double anointing and a portion of my Father's spirit. I want his blessing. He and I agreed he was going to give me his blessings, and we were going to, And he died just hours before I could get it. So I went ahead and did it anyway. And so the anointing travels in inedible, inedible objects. Well, your body is an inedible object. So I laid hands on him. And you know, the interpretation of dreams, just, I mean, dream, dream, dream. I started dreaming and dreaming and dreaming and dreaming. And you don't know how many things I've dreamed at night, and that whole thing plays out the next day. It's just absolutely wild. I dreamed about the two women that bowed up like cats, the, the gypsy like, no uh, offense intended to say a gypsy. I don't know if you can or can anymore, but they look like gypsies. And I walked in the store in the dream, and when I did, they bowed up like cats and hissed. Well, lo and behold, later that day, I walked into a drugstore, and when I went walking in, there they were, and they did exactly, exactly what I dreamed as I walked right by them, and it was the anointing on my life, and the anointing that was on my life would just shake up stuff that knew the anointing was on my life, even though people didn't, other things did. Are you hearing me? That ripple effect in that mantle, that mantle is a double portion, a double portion of his spirit. Now, what kind of spirit did he have? Raising the dead, healing the sick, casting out devils. Billy Graham's mantle was soul winning. His mantle was conviction, not guilt. His mantle was exposing the love of God for you. That was his mantle. That's going to double. We're going to see more compassion, more preaching. You're going to see more souls won. You're going to have more people that's going to say, why go to church and just go home when I can go to church, be to church, leave the church, and still be to church, and everywhere I go, I take the church. That's why I told the law enforcer when I went to a federal building for a court case as a character reference for a person, and it was time to get ready to go in, and I said, let's pray. And a big officer said, not in here, a federal building, it's prohibited. And I went ahead and prayed anyway. And we got, and when I got through, he's huffing and puffing and looking at me. And I said, it's all right. I said, I prayed in this building. And so I don't let this building jeopardize what happens to this, this building. Are you all right? Listen, if God ain't welcome in the public school, I'm not. Because guess who he's in me? Are you hearing me? I, if God's not welcome, I'm not welcome. But guess what? We will show up anyway. And we will bring a message of love and strength and help. Even in the midst of not being wanted, we'll still help you. Can I get an amen out there? I'm telling you, if there's something in your life that has got you at the place in your life that you feel distant from God, you used to feel so close to him, but something is there. You heard what Billy said for six minutes. Six stands for man. Out of those six minutes, did any of you hear anything that just made you think, wow, that does keep me out of the kingdom, walking completely in the kingdom of God. See, he didn't preach on sin. He exposed what keeps you from walking in righteousness. Are you hearing where I'm coming from? There's a big difference in exposing sin and preaching on sin. Big difference. And so one of them will bring conviction. The other one brings guilt and condemnation. And God won't do that. Now, I'm not going to deny conviction feels pretty much like God. I mean, it's like, ugh. But at the same time, it's, there's a way out with it. Because when you're under condemnation, there's no outlet. When you're under conviction, all you got to do is say yes, and all the conviction's gone. You're free. You know, you were convicted and sentenced. But boy, when you repented, that sentence was, was revoked, and now you're free. I was locked up, and now I'm out. I didn't even know I was locked up. I didn't know I was in prison. And let me tell you something. When I left Duke Power on that last Friday, 
That very last Friday, that had been June 10th, 1977, when I walked out that door, my hair was a hanging long, and I was selling pot out there, and I was hanging still and laughing and cutting up. I've always been kind of a cut up. But when I came back Monday morning, now watch this. I hadn't been to church yet. Isn't that something? How could something happen that didn't happen in a church building? I haven't been to church yet. But guess what happened? Church came to my house. God sent Billy for a whole week, and then he come down and sent my daddy to sweep up the mess. Hello. And, buddy, I'm telling you, I was a mess. And all I can tell you is when I walked in there and they handed me my brass, and they looked at me and they said, well, you look different. Just like that. I said, you look different. And I said, hey, man, far out. I accept you, Christ, man. That's why I used to talk. I don't know why, but I did. And I probably did that two or three years after I got saved. If everything was a drag, it's a man, far out, man. You know what I'm saying, man? I don't know, man, you know? Everybody was a man, even a woman. Yeah, man, you know what I'm saying? And so I walked, that's what I told him. Hey, man, I met Christ. And I heard a guy behind me when I say that, and he said, a bunch of people do that. He said, that's souls. He'll be back in a week or less. You know, you get in construction and you, you get what they call religion. You, you backslide. Anybody here ever work construction? Three or four of us? Well, listen, you know, if you go to church and you get saved and you come tell everybody and then you backslide, that's the most miserable life in the world. Construction workers will work on you worse than the devil. The devil and his demons go to the Bahamas because the construction workers will take over. Are you hearing me? And, I mean, boy, I came in and I was so sold out for God that I hadn't, still hadn't been to church. And I'm telling everybody about Jesus. Well, I wasn't a good reader in that day. I could read a little bit, but, but if it was over five letters, it, it was a hard word to pronounce. And so I was struggling. I was trying to read. I had Kathy read the Bible to me every day for about six months, all the time. Read, 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 read. She got so mad at me. I had to go back to school. So I went back to school on the GI Bill. And I got out of school. Hallelujah. She told me to do my own reading. Now I do my own reading. And my wife's been set free from having to read for me. And I went back to school. I went to school forever. <laughs> I think I'm still in school. And God has been so good, and he's done so much for us. He's done so much through us and in us that, that even today as I stand and think about Billy Graham's life, it's not anywhere near over. His life just started. Billy Graham said with his own mouth and a smile, I can't wait to see the face of God. Well, let me tell you, he's not only seeing the face of God, but he's also looking down over that amphitheater. And I bet he's telling the Lord right now, you know, I don't like as much attention. And I know the Lord's looking back at him and grinning and going, but that's okay. You might be getting some attention, but I'm getting a lot of souls. I'm going to be getting a lot of my children back because of this. Why? Because it how prophetic is this? It's the year 18. 18 means you're freed from bondage. Billy Graham went to heaven. Who's that? The most well-known, more people born again under his ministry than anybody we know that have the right to a double portion of his mantle. And because of that, the whole entire earth that's anybody been affected by that ripple gets a double portion of that ripple. And you're going to turn into a soul winner like you never thought before. And you're going to say, am I going to be in meetings with thousands? Maybe, but you're going to be in meetings where you have lunch, where you go to the break room, what machine you work on, wherever you're delivering, whatever you're doing, there's going to be an opportunity, there's going to be a time, and you're going to start reaping the harvest, reaping the harvest the souls and when you start winning souls and you go home and lay in your bed and pray at night and you're thinking about it you can feel the peace of God the joy it's like the Lord just comes down and embraces you there's nothing he loves more than people giving their hearts to him and if you're a part of making that happen I'm telling you there's an anointing on your life that'll drive out every infirmity every burden of your life and if y'all want to get ready I'm going to play a song in just a minute I have them sing a song and I know you've heard it before you ever heard of just as I am well, I'm going to do this in loving honor of Billy Graham. There ain't going to be any memory because he was, he is, and he still shall be. You is and I is and we shall be. Terrible English, but it's the truth. But Billy Graham had a way in the gospel. The Lord anointed him in a way to share the truth of God's love to us that it didn't condemn us, but that through Jesus Christ that we might be saved and not condemned. And that's what happened. That night, Larry Souls died and went to heaven. 
Now, most people don't understand that. Most people think when you physically die, you go to, when you get born again, you go to heaven. Heaven come in you. That's why the Bible says in the body, out of the body. It, it don't matter. You're still present with God. And when you get the revelation of that and meditate on it, and then you get the revelation of your fellowshipping with God right now, like you've stepped out of the body, it gets pretty awesome because it's all by faith. Are you hearing me? Yeah. It's all by faith. Well, anyway, it is a beautiful day. And uh, I think this whole week is going to be a great week to honor his life. And more than anything, I want to thank God that somebody, even if it was Billy Gray, somebody knew how to say what needed to be said in a way that I heard God instead of an angry man preaching at people that's mad about sin. I heard a loving man that hates sin preach about love and how that sin had kept me away from all that love. That sin was trying to keep me from having eternal life. And not only eternal, but the life of God here in the earth to release the purpose of God while I'm here. While I'm in this flesh that came from dust, I got a dusty ministry right now. And until this dusty ministry is over, woo! I want to spread as much dust as I can. I want people to get born again and know Jesus is Lord. He will deliver you from drugs and alcohol, inferiority. He'll deliver you from sickness and disease and poverty. He will deliver you. He'll deliver you from prison. There's a man named Crow. Didn't plan to say this. Crow was in the maximum unit up here in, uh, oh, I can't think of the city, Mooresville. And when I went up there and preached, and preach that very message. He'll get you out of prison. He come up to me and he said, I have a life sentence with no parole. He said, I got born again listening to you preach. And today you're preaching about God will get me out of here. He said, I'm going to believe that. And I'm going to start confessing that I'm out of here. He said, now with the crime I've got, they probably would never let me out. But with the God that forgave me, I'll get out. And I said, I agree with you, Crow big strong good looking black man and I'm telling you I went there about four years later I went there every Wednesday four years went by I walked in and he is grinning you could see his teeth ten miles I said crew what you grinning like that for he said I couldn't wait to see you and I said what's happening he said I'm being released next month I said what he said I'm being released I got a miracle and he went into it well he's still an evangelist and he's preaching all over the world. Hallelujah. That was a man sentenced for life in prison for a horrible crime. And Billy Graham found a little old drug head and preached to him. He said, yes, Lord. And later that drug head, born again, preached to Crow. Crow said, yes, Lord. And so God takes him out of prison and puts him in the ministry. And before he got him out of prison, guess what? He had a prison ministry. Because he preached there for four years. The days I wasn't there, guess who was preaching? Crow. And that's all I know is Crow. I don't even know his last name. I could go on and on and on. There's billions of things that's happened because of a life getting... Can you imagine what's happened just because you got born again? Look at the people that have changed, the relationships. So as they begin to just play just as I am, stand up on your feet with me. Because that just as I am is a reality because no matter who you are, you can only come to God just as you are. And when we come to God singing just as I am, whoo, I know you think in traditional, well, brother, there's not a great revelation in that song about, well, hey, look, don't go there with me. Let's stop and realize that that song, no matter your opinion of it, was playing when thousands and thousands, maybe millions, come on, come on. have made a decision to say, Lord, I've been a sinner all my life and all I can do is just bring what I am to you and I can come to you just as I am and anything else that's going to happen, it's got to be you. That's all God wants. He wants you just like you are because he's not going to leave you like you are. Are you all right? Hallelujah. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for this day. I thank you for salvation the blood of Jesus Christ and the power of God in our life that sets us free. I thank you, Father, that we don't have to spend eternity in hell and in damnation with a devil and his demons. 
that through the blood of Jesus Christ we have everlasting life. Whosoever believes on me, he shall never perish, but shall have everlasting life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever would believe in him shall be saved. Shall be. Whosoever will. So right now, I'm just going to do the service like this. I know we always do it in our chairs. But if you would like to rededicate your life, if you've never accepted Christ, if there's something in your life you feel like the Lord's told you to do and you haven't even done it yet, or you think it's too late, I'm saying to you it's not too late. Just say, I'm sorry, Lord. Give me the strength and power. And He will. And so as they play just as I am, I know most of you are not moving out of your chairs that much, but I would like to open this whole front up. Come on. And so as they sing, if you're wanting some of that double anointing, that come double on, mantle, on, if you on. want to see yeah. God move in the earth, then you just come down here, come get on. your heart clean about anything that you're not happy with in your life but between you and God, and just get it over with. Just if it's, if it's a rededication of something you used to do and you don't do it, just come on down and get it up. When we find out that coming down, it makes you feel better going out than it does staying where you are, you're going to wish you'd uh, come on down. <laughs> Amen. Sister, go ahead and bless us with that song. And as she sings, as the Lord moves on you, just come down and let the anointing touch you. church I'm going to just pray for the Lord to, to give all of us a double anointing of that mantle Father we've all moved I'm already down here so I couldn't get up and come down here but if I'd have been on the back row Lord I would have run right here and Father I thank you right now I repent and I am saying that I'm so sorry for everything that I should have ever done and I did not complete. I'm so grateful for what has happened. But Father, I pray for strength in my spirit and I thank you for forgiving me of my lack and my slackness. But I thank you that you're more than enough. And I lean on you and I trust you. And as 41 years ago, when I bowed my knee to you today, I thank you. You're still the one that just wipes the dust off my shelf. You're the one that makes me strong. You're the one that heals me and cleanses me. You're the one that encourages me and motivates me. Father, we all should have been dead or sick a long time ago. But today, we're alive and strong because of you. And we thank you as you help us carry your word out, your anointing and your purpose in this earth that we will always remember you're in our presence. You're in our place. You are here with us and you will not leave us. You will not forsake us. You promised. And I can honestly say for four decades, oh, have you shown that to Larry Souls? You've never left me. You never forsook me. And when I went and made my bed in hell, when I woke up the next morning, you laying in the bed with me. 
Oh, God, you got me out of it and you took me back to where I'm supposed to be. I thank you that you won't never leave me. You won't never forsake me. When I give my heart to you, I'm anchored forever because no man can take me out of your hand. And I thank you for the power of the blood of Jesus Christ. It redeemed me. It saved me. And it set me free. And I'm not ashamed. I'm not ashamed to decree of the goodness and the glory of my daddy or what he'd done for me. And I give you all the praise, the glory, and the honor. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for cleansing me daily. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Father God. I give you all the praise, the glory, and the honor. Woo! Everybody, if you've never prayed this prayer before, say this out loud with me. Everybody say it anyway, even if you have prayed it. Say, oh God, I thank you today for the blood of Jesus. Washing away my sins. And today, I say blood, wash it away. And I thank you for it. And I receive it. Give him praise, because he did. When you ask him, he did. Hallelujah. You're redeemed. You're born again. You're saved. Hallelujah. We got a way to go, but it's all good. It's all good. Thank you, Thank you, Lord. Oh, Father, we thank you for this day of life. And, Father, as this group of people go out the door, raise your hands up in there, everybody. As they go out the door, their hands are stretched up in the air. I thank you that the anointing to witness, to win souls, to read that Bible, to pray, to come across every person in here with a double anointing of that spirit, to be encouraged, to know that the life of Billy Graham be an example to all of us. He lived right at tapping a hundred years, walking with God, and he lived with God, for God, and now he's with God, and now the whole world's getting ready to get a double jolt of an anointing because the day of Christ is soon. It is upon us. And let's get ready for the greatest revival the world has ever seen in Jesus' name. And everybody said, yes and amen. Hallelujah. Worthy, worthy, worthy. King of kings. Lord of lords. Most high. Woo. Oh my goodness, you are so good, you are my goodness. Oh my healer. Hey, calling them things that be not as though they were. We love you today. We worship you today. Want a day of salvation. And you might say, well, Pastor, I've been saved a long time. Well, that's good. It's still a day of salvation for us. And it keeps your salvation strong. Amen. I know there's another service. I got to let y'all go. This one was so good. Might just show the CD and let them see. <laughs> but I love you guys. And I'm excited about this year, 2018. Not only is Shield of Faith going to grow, the kingdom of God all over the earth is getting ready to expand, man. That's what it's about. Amen. Well, if you'd like prayer for something while we're, others are coming, come on down. We'll pray for you. I love you. God bless you. Go do the word. And thank you, worship team. You're awesome. We love you.